Spirit System and the Spirit World Around Us Facebook group. I am streaming live on Wednesday, 8 p.m. real time, and I believe it's probably 6 p.m. Uh, New York time and um, 3 p.m. on Pacific time on Wednesday, November 13th. And we're here on every Wednesday night. And we are on right now streaming on Spiritism and the Spirit World around this Facebook group. So I want to welcome everybody. And we are talking about near-death experiences. We have a very exciting one. And it's about Ronnie, the boy who was ran over by a car. And what I am doing here in, is I am interpreting near-death experiences with the information that was given to us by the codifier of Spiritism and other uh, writers of spiritism. The first, of course, the codifier was Alan Kardec. I recommend everyone to read the spirits book. It was he who had gave a series of 1,019 questions to mediums throughout Europe and didn't use the answers unless the, the answers were similar or exactly the same. And of course, he this was all from organized by the spirit of truth as promised us in the New Testament from Jesus. Now, the NDEs I'm going over, you can look in my book. You can read in my book what really happens during near-death experiences according to Spiritism. And you can check down the links below when I load this up to YouTube or BitChute. Please subscribe, comment, share. Uh, share this to other Facebook sites if you're watching this on one of the Facebook groups. So let's get started. This is an exciting uh exciting NDE. This is very different. So Ronnie was a young boy when his NDE occurred. Ordinarily, his accident would barely receive two paragraphs in the local paper. All of his neighbors would know the, of the tragedy, which either killed or maimed the boy for life. His entire extended family would spend years caring for him. But none of this happened. Ronnie walked away from being run over by a car not just a glancing blow that spun him out of harm's way, a full-on encounter with the entire weight of an automobile driving over his body. Now, I found this NDE from the nderf.org website, which is the Near Death Experience Research Foundation.org website, NDERF. And it is a fountain of compelling accounts far di from, from different countries, different languages and cultures, all tells of a momentary intersection with a universe that is not ours. Now, this is, this is one near-death experience amongst a multitude of sightings of people going to a parallel or different dimensions. A dimension that most of us can't perceive, but those who reside there can't see us. We come from that other place originally, the other world, as the Druids call it. This is where the other side, this is where we really live. Not here in this physical, dense domain where our bodies grow and decay in such a short span relatively to our mortal life on Earth uh, and in the spirit realm, I should say. The Druids knew that we lived in temporary vessels. The Gulls would hear, hurl themselves into battle with their courage bolstered by their certainty that if they perished, they would return to fight another day in another body. Whereas their undisciplined battle order fell time and time again to the well-trained and ordered Romans, their bravery was never in doubt. Little wonder that not only did Caesar take their territory and freedom, but in order to finally subjugate the unruly Gauls, he had to pursue and wipe out the Druids, similar to what the Romans subsequently attempted to do with the Christians, another dangerous religion that preached about a life beyond the earth. Now, let's go talk about Ronnie. Let's talk about the accident. So this is what Ronnie described, what he was doing before the accident. I was sledding down an alley that intersected with an avenue at the bottom. I could not stop before entering the avenue. I went out into the street and struck the front bumper of a white Cadillac with my head. So this is Ronnie, a typical kid, seeking the thrill of sledding down a steep road, never realizing the danger which could await him below. As soon as Ronnie's head hit the front bumper, he left his body and became a spectator. This is what he wrote. 
That very moment, I left myself and was out on the sidewalk. I was not standing on the ground. I was hovering. There was a girl my age standing on the ground next to me, holding her head and screaming. I could hear her, and I looked at her. She was very afraid of what she was seeing, so I turned and looked in the direction she was looking. It was me, and I was in the process of about to be run over by the car. At that time, a knowledge came to me that if I wanted any chance to live, I needed to slow the car down so when the tire went over me, the body had to be on its back. I knew somehow that if the car ran me over on my stomach, it would not survive. I did. I slowed the car down and was directing the car when to go over the body. I did it to run over the body facing up, and now I had to have the same thing happen with the back tire. The car being so low to the ground was making my body roll over and over. Once it got near the rear tire, I slowed down the car again, so it ran over me facing up. It did. It ran over me facing up. Now the body was stuck behind the rear tire in a big clump of snow that was stuck to the car. I watched the car drag my body down the road until they intersected the next road. When the car hit the dip in the road, my body fell out. I remember being glad it was over, but the girl was still screaming. She screamed all the way through the experience. Because she was screaming, a man came out of his house at the back door. He looked towards us and looked in the direction the girl or we were looking. He saw my body. He ran over to it. The body was crawling, only using only the left arm. I think it was trying to go home. I'm not sure. So let's go on what's next, and I'll, and I'll go over what, what was happening. So next he was rushed to the hospital. He knew his entire body was full of blood from internal bleeding. When he reached the emergency room, the doctors told him mother that he had little chance to live. They could not operate because the internal bleeding was so profuse that once he was open, he would immediately bleed to death. Ronnie was put on observation to determine if the flow of blood would diminish enough to allow the doctors inside to repair the damage. A priest was called to give Ronnie his last rites and to make his mother and family comfortable in the knowledge that Ronnie would be taken care of in heaven. Now, this is what he remembers. This is what he wrote next. I remember things going on and off. My whole family was there at the hospital. Six doctors were around me talking. My mother sent for a priest for my last rites. She did not know, nor did any doctor knew what I knew. I was going to be okay. When Father T, let's call him T, arrived, I tried to talk to him, but couldn't. I could only move my left arm and my head side to side. So I kept reaching out to him over and over again. Father T looked into my eyes and I shook my head no. We did not talk, but, but we did. He looked again in my eyes with a smile as saying, you've been there and you're going to be okay. I shook my head yes. He then told my mother he's going to be fine, that I did not need last rites. She insisted that he did. As he began the last rite, we kept smiling at each other, like in conversation that we know, but they don't. Now, isn't it interesting? Father T was correct. His faith, and he must have had some connection with the spirit world, his faith enabled him to realize the small boy on the bed, surrounded by doctors, was going to pull through. Spirits who were also in the room caring for Ronnie, giving him magnetic passes so his body could heal quickly, let the Reverend Father know that he would not lose one of his flock. So imagine in this room, you have all these humans, and the doctors are saying this boy will not live. The father knew. Now, how did he know? Because there were other spirits in the room, and they were taking the time to communicate to the father why either the same or other spirits were there working on Ronnie. They were giving him passes. They were sending magnetic impulses, trying to stop the, the bleeding, internal bleeding that happened. Now, again, Ronnie's accident is one of those things. Now, so many spiritists say that nothing is by chance, but I have read several NDEs where, where the spirits come and they save someone because this should not have happened. And this is, I think, the same thing with Ronnie. He should not have been essentially mortally uh, injured. So they had to pull out all the stops and save him. And this is what they did. So the doctors wanted to let Ronnie stabilize so they could operate. 
They left for the night, not really expecting to see Ronnie alive the next morning. I thought he was going to bleed to death. Then Ronnie had a second close call the next day. This is what he wrote. The hospital kept a 24-hour Virgil over me, taking vitals at times. The doctors told my mother, if we can stabilize him, we will operate. I knew that there would be no operation. In the early mornings, I fell asleep. The nurse panicked and started giving me oxygen, calling for help. Little did she know that blowing up my lungs with oxygen was piercing my lungs from the broken ribs. I could not fight her off, nor the others that had answered her call for help. I could only move my left arm. So again, I left my body and watched as they tried to help. Finally, a male nurse said to take the oxygen off, and they did. I was fine. So how did Ronnie, this, this boy, know that supplying him with oxygen was the wrong procedure? He knew because his guardian spirit was there with him, assessing the situation. Most probably, it was his guardian who notified the male nurse via mental suggestion to come into the room and rectify the situation. Later, the doctors came to Ronnie's bedside to assess the patient. This is what he said. In the morning, the doctors began coming in one by one. They were discussing my condition and could not explain what happened to me with each other, but I knew. Finally, the doctors went out and told my family, we cannot explain it, but we cannot find any blood in his cavity. He is stable and that they will continue watching me. So, how could Ronnie be healed and the blood that had filled his entire body, body cavity be reabsorbed? Well, it was the work of a dedicated team of spirits who came at the request of Ronnie's guardian spirit. Guardian spirits don't work alone, right? Our guardian angels, they are there for us. But when they need more people to help them, to help you, they bring in their friends, just like on earth, where we have a group of friends that help us move, help us paint the, you know, paint the house, do something, right? Think, and we help them. Again, they have friends that they can call too. It's a lot like earth, but a lot better. So these spirits, by utilizing magnetic passes, whereby universal fluid is directed at Ronnie's body and transformed into vital fluid, which corresponds to his needs, the physical shell for Ronnie's spirit was able to amass the resources required to heal itself. Now, your body utilizes vital fluids, which is a modification of the universal fluids. Universal fluids make up everything in the universe. Now, the vital fluids they are created by modifying universal fluid to fit your spirit and body. In a, a spiritist meeting, after the meeting, what they, they do, you go to a spiritist meeting and someone talks for half hour or an hour, and then you'll give passes. And someone, you'll sit down in a chair, someone will stand in front of you and they will pass their hands. They won't touch you, but they'll pass their hand. But unseen to you, behind that physical body, that like that medium, healing medium, there's a spirit that is directing universal fluid through the body of that physical medium. And then that turns into a, a custom-made vital fluid for your body and that helps heal you, helps, helps harmonize your, your four centers, chakras, also called. And then, which, of course, your chakras are responsible for keeping all your body functions in harmony. And the more vital fluid you have, the healthier and more vitality you possess. So, Ronnie fully recovered. His ribs healed and his flesh mended. He had no discernible injuries after his horrendous accident. Now, you would see, his family would say, well, this is a miracle. Now, Spiritism tells us there is no such thing as miracles. Those are only things you don't understand. There's always an explanation. So, Ronnie's account of being struck by the car and surviving with no lasting injuries would easily be considered a miracle in many people's mind. The odds that a young child would escape free of future disabilities from front and back tires rolling over his body and being dragged would be astronomical. And yes, with modern medicine, many would survive. But to have no detecta uh, detectable bleeding in his body, even after the nurse gave him oxygen, is a true anomaly. Therefore, 
Was Ronnie's escape a miracle? According to Spiritism, no. A miracle is an act of God that is contrary to the laws of nature, an unexplainable incident. Yet Spiritism states there are no events which do not follow the natural laws of God. Hence, all manifestations, no matter how improbable or completely impossible, adhere to the divine laws. While it may be a miracle to our eyes, the actual episode followed step by step a set of divine laws which rule the universe. Whereas we on earth are like the cargo cults of New Guinea. During World War II, the Aborigines of New Guinea saw planes crash and sometimes misdirected parachute supplies landed within their tribal boundaries. Having no notion of 20th century technology, they believed the material goods dropped on them were manna from the gods. They devised symbolic copies of airplanes made out of bamboo and other plants from the jungle to notify the gods they were ready for more. Our present culture rejects anything we can't explain, or worse, we assign it a fancy name to make it appear we comprehend a condition, but in reality, we are merely categorizing a mystery. One example of this is the term sleep paralysis. What is the definition of this condition? According to Wikipedia, it is sleep paralysis is a phenomenon in which a person, either falling asleep or awakening, temporarily experiences an inability to move, speak, or react. It is a transitional state between wakefulness and sleep characterized by complete muscle atonia, muscle weakness. It is often accompanied by terrifying hallucinations, such as an intruder to the room, to which one is unable to react due to paralysis in physical experiences, such as a strong current running through the upper body. One hypothesis is that it results from disrupted REM, rapid eye movement, sleep, which normally induces complete muscle atonia to prevent sleepers from acting out their dreams. Sleep paralysis has been linked to disorders such as narcolepsy, migraines, anxiety disorders, and obstructive sleep apnea. However, it can also occur in isolation. So, no mention of possession by spirits or other death experiences, after death experiences, no spiritual connotations whatsoever, as if the roots of our very existence where humans live closer to God and his messengers were all fragments of our collective imagination. The definition fails in its inability to precisely account for the multitude of people who swear they have been visited or talk to spirits. Anything to do with a world beyond our control is summed up in one word, hallucinations. It must be hallucination. So, let me tell you, I confess at one time I thought the two. Now, first, I have had sleep paralysis, but... I was not asleep. I was, I think I was like 21 in a hotel room on the Greek island of Kos. And I was laying in the bed. And this is, you know, I had, I wasn't a spiritist then. I was, I believe in God, but I believed in God far away. And I was just laying there. And then all of a sudden I heard dogs barking way down the street. I go, oh. And then I tried to move. And before I tried to move, the dog started barking closer to me. And these were different dogs, were like something was coming. And then I started, I tried to move and I couldn't move. And I thought it was all my strength to move. And I had not fallen asleep. And then I had this vision of me being close to the water, coming in like two, three, two feet above the water it was, you know, just my body heading towards a beach. And I just kept fighting it completely. And then finally I could move. That wasn't, that wasn't muscle atonia. That was a spirit trying to take control of me, doing their best. And I would not allow it. I could move for a while. I don't know, it lasted probably five, 10 seconds, but I didn't let it happen. So before that, I would say, yeah, this is a very, you know, logical. I dismiss or heard, you know, these type of things. Oh, that's just hallucinations or weak minds. How could they be so stupid? Until the time that I, the know-it-all experience that event, 
then that was just me even then though like other things with ndes and you know you know visiting the spirit world i uh no i don't think so but and i didn't really connect that with my own small tiny experience and of course then i thought yes that was a hallucination but then I experienced another series of events that could not be dismissed as hallucination. Now, I didn't have an NDE or any type of conversation or sighting of a spirit. Jesus, or an all-knowing God. Mine was simply being told of an upcoming incident, a foretelling that took more than 20 years to unfold that shook me off my pedestal and taught me that I know nothing and I am nothing. Suffice to say, my wife was told of her future life with uncanny accuracy, including the events that I, her husband, would experience. And there were many things that my wife told me. I was oblivious to all of them, putting, down, putting each down to coincidence. But finally, after the accumulation of proof, I was told exactly how I would lose my job, what the ramifications would be, and who I would work for next. That set me off on discovery a journey that I am still on. And just like everybody, I go over this in greater detail in my, in my book, uh, The Seven Tenets of Spiritism, how they impact your daily life. And it's really more of my, my uh, personal, you know, growth and, and what happened to me and my own, you know, my own stories and certain things of, how I, I found spiritism, how, how I understand spiritism, how now it's changed me a lot. For well, that's the seven tenets of spiritism. So let's keep going. So when I, these things happen to me, I, I, was, I put on a quest, right, to determine how the future could be told with certainty. When I, the rational being, had absolute faith that we on earth were just random bits of organic material that grew and died for no particular purpose. Now I understand through spiritism that we are part of a fantastic universe of love, not of leisure. Sorry for those who think you're going to go to heaven and do nothing, but, you know, play your harp and sit on a cloud. No, it's one of caring and hard work, work that we require to perfect ourselves. And within our universe is a set of laws that we are guided by. Laws that, for the most part, are beyond our current understanding, but are rational nevertheless. As part of the, the structure of, of the structure of divine laws, there exists a spiritual world with immense capability. Capability that was responsible for Ronnie to be ran over by a car and not lose his life or become paralyzed. Now, let me say, let me go through and tell you what I think really happened during his accident. My interpretation of how Ronnie survived his ordeal is a little different than his perspective. Whereas Ronnie believed he slowed down the car, the greatest probability is that a guardian spirit vastly increased his ability to think and react. When a person throws a punch at, at us or an object is hurled in our direction, if we had not anticipated it, we would take about three quarters of a second to react. The time it takes for a moving car to cross the same space from the front wheel to the back wheel is extremely fast. For an average car to stop at 35 miles per hour takes about 106 feet. A car traveling at 30 miles per hour travels 45, 44 feet every second. A 2015 Chevy Camaro is about 16 feet in length with a wheelbase of 9 feet 4 inches. Therefore, at 30 miles per hour, it would take approximately two-tenths of a second to run over an object with the front and back tires. Ronnie states that he maneuvered himself on his back to protect his spine before the first wheel hit him. Next, by the force of the forward motion of the car and the rotating tire, he spun round and round and managed to land perfectly on his back once more just before the rear tire ran over him a maneuver that a trained athlete wouldn't have a hope of performing. What occurred was his guardian angels fed his body the precise movements required. Aerial gymnastics in which Ronnie made a score of perfect tens. Ronnie's perception was heightened to a degree of what we have no measure. He measured time in microseconds, seeing each one thousandth of a second as we perceive minutes. 
his guardian angel orchestrated his survival. Time can be whatever the spirit world wants us to be. Now remember, there is no time measured in the spirit world, in, in the levels of heaven around the earth. They measure it in duration. There is no, you don't grow older. There is no Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. There is no time. There are, there are uh, changes of events. Things happen, but you don't say, I'll see you in an hour from now doesn't work that way it's also why when we and some of you who've talked to spirits or talked to mediums and you say well when's this going to happen spirit world has a hard time telling us the time on earth i have a whole article that and that's in my my books too also uh in my other book on ndes i talk about a guy that had an nde and it measured eight minutes and he thought he was gone for over 2,000 years. So the time is what they want it to be for us. So what happened? So it's not a miracle, but a demonstration of the power that surrounds us, a force of such immensity that the time required to calculate the exact position for Ronnie's body at each moment in time was done in an imperceptible interval then to communicate directly to Ronnie's conscious thoughts and have his body react according to the plan is a task that our most powerful computers would probably fail. It's not a miracle, but it was a small gift to an innocent child and importantly to us as a signpost, a marker that points, thanks to Ronnie's description, onward to discovering for ourselves the wondrous world around us leading us to conclude that our knowledge of the universal laws are woefully inadequate. We must acknowledge our immaturity and seek comprehensions about the spirit world from unconventional sources. Sometimes, most certainly, we may be mistaken, while at other junctions we may stumble upon the right track. We must get off the paid road, road of stifling convention and onto the path of our own discovery. So when the ordeal of surviving the assault of the front and rear tires of the car was completed, Ronnie laid in the snow, watching the little girl crying and people rushing to his, assist, to his assistance. Spirits talked to him. This is what he said. At that time and that moment, I was told to go back or come forward. I went over to my body. I did not walk. I just floated like over. I was hovering over my body when again I was told it's getting late. Made up, make up your mind what you're going to do. The spirit world always respects our free will. As I was looking down, I said, I'm not going in there. That body was bleeding out its mouth and ears and nose. I could see the pain it was in. So I said, I'm not going back in there. This is when I left the site. It sounded like some kind of machine turned on, and I was in this very dark tunnel with a very tiny spot of light way far in front of me. I could feel myself going forward towards the light. As I got closer to the light, I noticed the light was brighter than any other light I ever saw in my life but it did not hurt my eyes. The feeling I had as I was getting closer was a feeling of love, kind of being in your mother's arms, but much, much more. So his body was laying in the snow. The car dropped him off in that dip, right? And he said, no, I don't want to go back in that body. He made a very logical decision. Why return to a banged up shell? Obviously damage beyond re repair. When your alternative is the home you know you belong to, a place where you are lighter, healthier, smarter, and faster, where colors are more vivid and your senses are eight times stronger. How do, you, how do we know you're able to sense more? Well, in the book, Workers of the Life Eternal, dictated by Andre Luis and psychographed by Francisco Chico C. Xavier, a spirit comments on the capabilities of incarnates, that's us. This is what the spirit says that we can do. Notwithstanding the progress of scientific investigation, ordinary humans can only perceive about one-eighth of the plane where they spend their existence. Sight and hearing, the two doors that could expand their intellectual research, continue to be greatly restricted. For instance, let us consider sunlight, which compress the basic colors that can be seen by corporeal eyes. We are only able to see colors that go from red to violet. And most people see nothing past the last five, which are blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. They fail to detect indigo and violet. However, there are other colors in the spectrum that corresponds to vibrations that the human eye is incapable of detecting. 
They are in infrared and ultraviolet rays, which the human researchers is able to identify imperfectly, but is unable to see visibly. So then what happened next? So Ronnie started making the journey home via a gold road. Then he saw the person he had been missing for so many years. I walk, this is what he said. I walked some more and came upon a pair of steps. The steps were solid gold. I remember thinking that if I could take some of these steps back to my mother, everything would be fine. My mom was a widow for a long time and we suffered hardships along the way. On the side of the steps was a plaque and it read flight number, number, number. I can't remember the number, but it was a three digit number. That's when I heard or noticed someone coming down the stairs. I ran a short distance away from the steps and kneeled down in the fog so I would not be seen. As this person began to come down the steps, I could see his feet and ankles and his legs. I felt now that I knew this person, but wasn't sure who it was. As he came down the steps, I could see his chest, and his chest had a white corsage on it. I should, I should have known at that point who he was, but I didn't. My dad had a white corsage on his chest lying in his casket before we buried him. When his faith, face came into view, I saw it was my dad. I was six-year-old when he died. I got up and started to run towards the stairs yelling, Dad, Dad, oh, Dad, I'm sorry for what I've done. He smiled at me, and I could see his gold tooth, and he stopped coming down the stairs, and he said to me, it doesn't matter as long as you are truly sorry for what you have done. And I replied, yes, Dad, I'm really sorry. Then he said, well, then that's all you need. How about you coming to live with me for a while? And I answered, yes, I would like that. He stretched out his hand for me to come, and I did. He took me by the hand and turned around, and we started walking up the steps. We took a few steps, and we stopped. He sighed and asked me, what's wrong? His head was down, looking towards the ground. He never looked at me again. I answered, I can't go with you. Mommy and Richie, my little brother, will cry. Once again, our loved ones, the people we miss so much in our lives, are in the other world waiting, waiting in a much better place than we. Our sorrow should be replaced with joy, knowing our loved ones, they finished their trial and are preparing for the next a new adventure comprising new courses of study combined with new events to push them on in their quest to become a better soul. Ronnie's father knew his son had to go back, but he wanted Ronnie to know he was fine and to give Ronnie the faith required to finish his trials, his assigned classes. The central reason we are here on this little planet in the middle of nowhere is to better ourselves. Ronnie had just started his schooling in life. The spirit world wanted him to continue. His plan didn't have him returning so soon. Hence, the spirit realm patched him up, patted him on the head, and sent him back for him to continue learning the needed lessons he so required so he could grow. Now, why do they want us to grow? Why are they giving us these lessons? Why do we need to go through these trials and tribulations? Why does our life have to be so tough? Well, the answer lies in what is awaiting for us in the spirit world. There is a whole world that I have not seen adequately described as far as the power of a high spirit in any science fiction or fantasy book I have ever read. In the spirit world, you have the power of your mind. Now, there's many people say, well, you make your own heaven and you know, you think of anything you want. There's partial truth to that. The fact is, there's the law of affinity places us with other people and we are with people like us and that the heaven is a collective state of high spirits who created that first environment and then a little bit less inferior spirits who are living in that environment and reinforce what that environment looks like. And then they all can co collectively change if the, all their character and their minds change or go to a higher plane. So it's not a free will chaos type thing. But as the higher you go, the more power you have to create what you want. You are actually trained in the lower levels of heaven how to use your mind to create a house, a statue, a tree, a bird from the universal fluid and changing the vibrations and harmony and density into what you want to make. And I talk about this in my book, Heaven and Below. You are trained. And as you go higher and higher, you have more and more power. Jesus Christ and his ministers helped create this whole solar system. 
you know, and even scientists will tell you this, the whole universe is, is, is dependent on some of these constants that are there. And if those constants were off a little bit, we wouldn't even be here. And, and they go, you know, this is a little bit strange. Well, it's not really. And I, I applaud them for finding them out, finding this out. But it's really the spirit world has created this physical universe for us to be trained. Now, why are we being trained in the spirit world, in the physical world, I should say? Because in the spirit world, when you are in one of the levels of heaven, as Ronnie said, and other people have had NDEs, you feel this atmosphere of love, and it's a wonderful place to learn, but it's not a wonderful place to really rip out the primitive emotions of what you had before, because we all start as a primitive spirit. The physical world is there for us to go through the hard knocks to us. So we, every tribulation, every bad episode that happens to us is almost 99.999% caused by something we've done in a past life. Karma is real. And we are each given a, a curriculum customized for us to teach us what we need to know. That is why we go through these trials. So we can learn to be good, kind, loving, honest people. And then when we rise in heaven and we have this power of our mind, we won't use it adversely because it's so powerful. We could go down to planets and hurt people and then hurt other spirits in lower levels. We would never want to do that and not gonna let us do that until we are trained. That is why we're going through what we are on earth. That is the lesson we need to learn. So if you would like to read my book, uh, Near Death, What Really Happens During ne Near Death Experiences According to Spiritism, please check the links below. I'm going to load this into uh, YouTube and BitChute and also um, uh, BitTube. And then please subscribe, share this video, share this video on Facebook, if you like, comment, and and then let me know. But you can find my books. I have on my website, nwspiritism.com. I have 14 books. I have my book, Seven Tenets of Spiritism, is, uh, is not only on Kindle and paperback. I also have that now on audio. So please, I will... Uh, and if you can also on the contact me page, I have lots of people lately been sending me emails on my website, nwspiritism.com. You can go to the contact page, send me an email of, of any questions you have. You can also sign up uh, and ask for classes uh, or ask for just to talk to me personally. You can go to spiritismstudy.org. You can scroll down a little bit. And me or another spiritist, you can set up a, an appointment and I'll con I'll send you an email back saying, okay, you wanted to meet at four o'clock Pacific time or whatever, something like that on Saturday. And I'll say, yes, I can do that. And I'll say, this is all, you know, let me know your WhatsApp or your Skype ID and I will call you then. So if you'd like to learn more, we would be more than happy to help. And again, this is just talking, nothing else. No, never asking for anything else. Anyway, I want to say thank you for being with me and God bless. God bless.